Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, thank you for joining our presentation. So today's topic is um, the recent VAT changes which uh, have been introduced by the government and what they mean for businesses going into 2023. Uh, before we start, I will just do a bit of housekeeping. Uh, if some of you face any technical difficulties with uh, uh, the app, um, you know, please, uh, please uh, give your comments or uh, ask questions in the uh, chat box. Similarly, if you have any questions uh, in respect of what we're talking about today, uh, VAT, or any other questions in our topics, which we might not be covering, uh, also you can uh, ask them in the chat box. Uh, we might not be able to answer them as immediately as you are um, asking them, but uh, at the end we will have a uh, questions and answers session. So we'll pick up some of those questions later. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and uh, we'll be sharing later the recording. Uh, so yeah, let's start um, just to quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Vlad Skibonov and I'm an associate partner with WTS Druva. I've been doing VAT for the last 17 years, uh, first in New Zealand, then uh, UK, and for the last six years, uh, I was with Deloitte and then WTS Druva in UAE. And uh, um, would be presenting today is uh, Git. Git. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Geet and I'm director with uh, WTS Rua. I've been part of the Rua family for more than eight years and a total indirect tax experience of more than 12 years. Uh, uh, so I lead some of the retail and hospitality clients uh, in Rua uh, in the GCC. And today I'm going to discuss some of the key amendments related to tax procedures law. Uh, great. Uh, so what do we have for agenda today? Uh, obviously, as you would be aware, uh, recently we have uh, um, received, uh, the government has published a number of changes to a number of pieces of legislation, tax legislation. Uh, so initially the purpose of today's uh, presentation was to discuss the uh, changes in key changes in VAT law and uh, federal tax procedures law. But luckily for all of us uh, today, the government also published some changes in the uh, executive regulations, VAT executive regulations. So we'll also bring out a few points from there as well. Uh, it wasn't that many. Uh, and we'll finish by, uh, you know, giving some pointers about things which businesses will need to be looking out for going into 2023. Uh, so let's start. Uh, we're going to start, like, you know, before we actually go into the, uh, what changes have been, um, uh, introduced uh, recently, uh, it's worth remembering, you know, the, the legislation was actually introduced five years ago. And uh, over the last five years, there were minimum amendments to either VAT law or regulations or FTP law and regulations. Uh, so the legislation was pretty much unchanged for the last five years. Uh, as you can see from here, there were zero changes to the law and there were three amendments to the regulations over the last five years. Um, and those uh, amendments were more important, you know, it, it was done kind of in a piecemeal fashion, uh, you know, dealing with specific issues, it was not uh, changes which would apply to most businesses. Um, similarly, for uh, tax procedures law, there was uh, only one change um, uh, on a couple of topics uh, over the last five years, and that was in respect of uh, tax litigations and penalty waivers. So the government has not shown up to date that uh, you know, it's willing to change laws uh, often. Um, however, it all have changed over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so the two weeks ago, the government has announced changes to the VAT law, uh, which introduced seven new definitions, uh, one brand new article in the law, and approximately 25 revisions to existing articles. Uh, and this new uh, amendments will be effective from 1 January 2023. So they're not retrospective, they will be prospective. Uh, and similarly for tax procedures law, so, uh, four new definitions inserted, uh, five new articles and more than 25 revisions. Uh, this will all be effective from 1st of March, 2023. Uh, so still a bit of time to prepare. And obviously today that we have a, uh, new executive regulations which just came in, 
uh, in essence, it's only two main changes uh, to, to articles have been changed, and we'll discuss them later. Uh, so if we start with the changes, the key amendments to the VAT law, uh, you know, we're not covering here every topic because we don't have enough time for that. We're just covering some of the more interesting topics. Uh, so the first one we'd like to discuss uh, amendments to pure hydrocarbons provisions. Um, so the background to this is that certain types of supplies in the UAE are subject to domestic reverse charge. And what domestic reverse charge means is that VAT obligation, uh, the obligation to pay VAT shifts from supplier, who is normally the person responsible for paying VAT to the recipient. So um, VAT is still imposed by the obligation to pay it shifts to the recipient. Um, and the VAT law only version mentions one provision, uh, one situation when um, domestic reverse charge applies to supplies. And this is on certain supplies uh, between businesses and those supplies must relate to crude oil, natural gas, refined or oil or gas, um, or any hybrid carbons. Uh, and that particular supply, there are extra conditions. One of them is that it is uh, B2B supply for resale. So if those conditions are met, then the recipient is able to report that VAT on the particular supply in their own return. And obviously they'll be able to recover that VAT under the normal rules. So supply is not responsible for paying that VAT. The one tricky moment with this particular article uh, was that uh, hydrocarbon was not defined. Um, and the question, came up, you know, what can it really include? You know, how far can you extend uh, the interpretation of what harbor carbon means? Uh, and specific example, which has been uh, quite uh, uh, relevant in this market was lubricant, uh, lubricants, because they consist of approximately 90% of petroleum hydrocarbon and 10% of other additives. So the market decided that it is harbor, uh, all lubricants are hydrocarbons and decided that domestic reverse charge applies. And uh, so what the industry was doing, we have an example here is, for example, oil and gas producer or, you know, or seller of, hydro of lubricants would be selling those oil lubricants to a distributor and they would treat it as uh, being any hydrocarbon in accordance with the article 40, 48. Uh, so, the supplier, who in this example is all producer, would not be charging 5% uh, VAT. Instead, the distributor uh, would self account for VAT on 5% uh, on its return and would then uh, claim that VAT back as well as input tax. Um, and then, if distributor later sells it to a customer or to somebody who's not uh, using it for resale, they would just charge 5% under the normal rules on their sale. Um, so this was common industry practice in the UAE and you know, big companies were uh, applying this, uh, domestic recharge on lubricants, um, but the FTA has disagreed. So the FTA has reviewed this particular uh, scenario um, um, in, in, as part of a number of clarifications and they disagreed that lubricants are hydrocarbons because of this additional additives which have been used uh, to produce them. Uh, and therefore, the uh, uh, FTA has uh, totally taken the opposite view that domestic reverse charge should not be applied. Obviously, what it means then that oil and gas producers should have been charging 5%, they didn't do it uh, because they instead applied reverse charge. So those producers would be subject to these penalties uh, from 2018 on all unpaid VAT. Obviously, it's huge penalties, a lot of tax at stake. Uh, there has been some dispute resolutions uh, on this particular topic, um, which are uh, you know, still happening. And so this particular change, which has just been introduced into the VAT law is meant to deal with the situation. So uh, while currently we do not have a definition of hydrocarbons, now the government has inserted a new definition. Uh, so hydrocarbons have been replaced by definition of pure hydrocarbons. And it is defined as a chemical compound essentially consisting only of uh, molecules of uh, hydrogen and carbon. So uh, therefore it resolves this uh, disputes and controversy which has existed before 
uh, in respect of the uh, earlier situations when prod products such as lubricants uh, were uh, subject to domestic reverse charge. Um, obviously, this applies uh, from 1 January 2023. Uh, so the previous position is still a bit uncertain. Uh, you know, obviously, the FTA has told us their view, but the businesses might be still disagreeing. So there will be some uh, situations and issues which need to be resolved uh, in respect of past. Uh, but going forward, uh, it is quite clear that lubricants cannot be inserted under that uh, definition of pure hydrocarbons. Um, interestingly, there is no definition of refined oil and gas, so <laughs> potentially it's possible to uh, consider what can be included under that. Uh, so that was the first um, uh, topic we had. Uh, secondly, another amendment which was made relates to uh, documents which you require for input tax recovery. Uh, as, as we know, the um, in order to recover input tax on your expenses, you um, you know you need to have certain documents. So you need to meet certain conditions. Uh, and in respect of documents, the conditions are that uh, you have to hold a valid tax invoice or some other documents which uh, might be accepted uh, by the FTA uh, as for executive regulations. Uh, unfortunately, there was nothing in the legislation which actually said what kind of documents you need specifically keep to evidence uh, your ability to uh, recover input tax on imports. Uh, while executive regulations did mention it, you know, if you're up, um, if you're accounting for VAT under reverse charge, you need to keep custom documents and uh, supply invoices. It did not connect it back to the ability to recover VAT. Uh, so uh, there has been a bit of uncertainty on this point, uh, which uh, has now been resolved by this new amendment. So now Article 55 of the VAT law provides specific information regarding uh, what documents you need to hold if you want to recover input tax on your imports. Uh, so for, you know, for your normal supplies, uh, local supplies, it's still you need tax invoice, uh, but for imports of goods, you need to keep a supplier's invoice, uh, which you know, doesn't need to be a tax invoice, it just needs to be invoice, uh, and also customs import documents. You know, so uh, custom declarations, which are produced by uh, customs. Uh, in terms of services, so for imports of services, you need to keep supplies and voices. Uh, so what it means for businesses, you know, now that we have this certainty that it's something what you need to hold to, in order to uh, be able to recover VAT, well, now the timing of you receiving these documents is very really important, right? Because uh, until this, until now, uh, businesses would typically, uh, those businesses which are, uh, account for reverse charge, they will typically recover their input tax in the same period in which they account for output tax. Uh, and later on, they might receive invoice and, uh, you know, that would meet that condition that you have to hold it. Uh, but now a precondition for recovering input tax is that you have this invoice, supply invoice, and in respect of goods that you also hold custom documentation. Uh, so you are not able then to recover your input tax and put it into your return until you hold that information. Um, so whereas, uh, so we have an example for some, you know, in respect of goods, you might clear the goods through customs in January, 2023. And this will be the time when you need to account for your um, output tax on the import. Uh, if you're doing it in spot of your VAT return, but then you might receive the custom documentation or uh, tax pay, um, supplies invoice only in February 2023. So you were not actually able to recover input tax until the tax and return which relates to February 2023. So you shouldn't be automatically now putting your output tax and reverse charge and input tax in the same tax return. You have to consider, do you actually have all the information uh, which allows you to recover input tax um, in respect to the particular import. And similar for services. So, um, for example, you might need to, uh, to make an advance payment. You make it in January 2023, but you don't actually 
receive invoice until April that year. Uh, so again, you uh, might need to account for uh, VAT under reverse charge in January, but until you actually have that invoice, which is now required by Article 55, you should not be recovering that input tax on, uh, in respect of that uh, supply. So the timing is important and it has to be considered uh, whenever you're doing your uh, tax, uh, tax returns. Uh, another change uh, which has been introduced as part of the uh, VAT law um, that relates to uh, timing for issuing tax invoices and tax credit notes. Uh, so under the current legislation, uh, VAT law, uh, the supplier has 14 days to issue a valid tax invoice in respect of any supply which is subject to date of supply under Article uh, 25. Uh, which in essence means, you know, it only applies to one-off supplies, uh, not periodic supplies. Uh, those supplies which are periodic, which are covered by date of supply rules in Article 26, uh, there was no effectively uh, timeline in the legislation. Similarly, uh, there was no timeline for issuing tax credit notes. So people knew that if there is an adjustment event which reduces your payable output tax, you have to issue tax credit note but there was nothing in the legislation which would actually tell you within what period you should do it. And a lot of businesses would habitually uh, do not issue tax invoices or uh, under for periodic supplies or uh, tax credit notes within 14 days period. Uh, as long as they had it on somewhere later date, you know, they can see that the conditions being met. Uh, well, this is changing again. So after the amendments, uh, which again will be valid from uh, 1st of January, 2023, uh, you have 14 days to issue any of those documents. So now there is a clarity about um, what has actually been, uh, about the deadlines which apply to uh, issuing these documents. So again, our businesses have to review their normal practices, uh, review how and when they issue tax invoices uh, for periodic supplies, tax credit notes, and make sure that this is all now aligned with the legislation. Because when FTA uh, does uh, audit you, they will be asking for that information. So the big change which was introduced in... Uh... So Vlad, before we start uh, discussing on FT audit, uh, should we have a poll question? Yes, yes, uh, thanks for reminder. So. Before we actually discuss statute of limitation, uh, we have a question which we ask all of you to um, answer. So as to whether you have been, you have been uh, subject to any tax audit yet. Um, so please make your choice. Just waiting for results. Yeah, so 85 people out of 150 have uh, put in their uh, answers. So we just we can just wait for a few more seconds and then launch the result. If you're consultants, you can vote yes if you know your clients have been subject to audit. Yes. So I think I'll end this poll. Uh, and the results are that almost 80% of them have not been subject to VAT audit and only 20 people out of 100 are, have voted and they are being currently or have been already subject to VAT audit. So almost 80% of the population is yet to be audited by the FTA. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. those 80% are lucky uh, for now uh, because the FTA has just introduced new rules which will potentially give them more time to issue um, audit notices. Um, so as you would be aware, uh, you know, th there is no specific articles for statute of limitation uh, in the VAT law, uh, uh, but under the uh, tax procedures law, uh, the FTA had five years in order to amend 
or issue a tax assessment in respect of any tax period. So it's five years from the end of that respective tax period. Um, after that, if the five years have passed, the FTA would not be able to reopen a particular tax period and change uh, VAT treatment. So even if there was an error, uh, you know, FTA would not be able to correct it uh, or do an assessment about it after five years. Um, and uh, obviously five years are coming up now, right? So VAT was introduced in 1st of January, 2018. Uh, the first returns, if you have one monthly basis would be end of January, uh, 2018. Five years would be January, end of January, uh, 2023. Uh, if you are March or that extended first return uh, from 2018 to, to April, you know, your five years are coming up in March, after March or April, 2023. Uh, and a lot of businesses were obviously looking forward to <laughs> the five years being uh, done um, because, you know, it was the first, you know, federal tax, uh, apart from excise tax, which was introduced in the UAE. The businesses uh, didn't get much notice before its introduction because the uh, executive regulations were not released till November. Uh, there were some complicated transitional rules which had to be put in those first returns. So obviously a lot of businesses are not so sure about the correctness of their VAT returns and adopted tax positions from 2018, especially in the first few returns. Um, uh, so a lot of businesses were happy to wait for another few months and uh, hope that nothing will happen. Well, now we potentially can be slightly more stressed than before because the FTA did amend uh, the VAT law by introducing a new state of limitation provision. Uh, so specific for VAT. Uh, and uh, while the general rule remains the same, so uh, FTA has five years to conduct a tax audit or issue a tax assessment from the end of the relevant tax period. Um, there are a few exceptions which uh, are potentially uh, have a big impact on businesses. So the first one is that if, a, not, if a, a notice of audit is issued by the FTA to the taxpayer within that five year period, then the FTA has another additional four years to conduct the tax audit. So by issuing the notice, uh, the FTA immediately gives itself four years extra to conduct the audit and do tax assessment, uh, which you know obviously we suspecting will be used to extend the ability of the FTA to audit those initial 2018 periods. Uh, so, um, um, you know, by issuing your notice, let's say over the next uh, few months, uh, in respect that you're going to be audited for 2018 periods, the FTA gives itself until uh, what's it, 2027 to actually conduct the audit and finalize it. Um, then uh, the second exception is that uh, if the taxpayer himself uh, issued uh, or submitted a voluntary disclosure in the fifth year uh, from the end of the relevant tax period, then the FTA has a one additional year to complete the audit and issue a tax assessment. So, hey, it's not four years, it's uh, um, five years. Uh, sorry, it's, it's one year that uh, the FTA would have to audit you. Uh, so to give you some examples, so under the current, under the current uh, rules, uh, let's say on the uh, return January to March 2018, the FTA has until end of March 2023 to issue uh, a notice or sorry, or complete a tax uh, assessment. If they do not actually complete the tax assessment and issue the tax assessment before 2023, they're time barred from correcting those returns. Under this, New amendment, uh, same period. Only all they need to do is to issue a notice of uh, audit during this five-year period. So they have until end of March 2023 to issue a notice. Uh, after which they still have until March 2027 to conduct the audit. Uh, obviously, it's a huge impact on businesses. Uh, you know, we do expect uh, a lot of businesses be receiving notices over the next uh, few months. Um, but also, if 
uh, you, you can imagine, let's say they uh, open your, give you notice of tax audit, you know, starting for period January um, to March 2018, up to whatever date they're conducting, uh, they should do the notice for. In theory, they can open up five years worth of periods for audit, right? And we all remember that the penalty regime in the UAE, different penalties apply depending on whether or not uh, an FTA issues a tax assessment during the tax audit or before tax audit is uh, initiated. So if there was a voluntary disclosure by a taxpayer before any notice of tax audit, the penalty is typically smaller. Uh, for any error, you know, to starts at 5%, can go up to 40 but if a uh, tax assessment is made and there was an error uh, after notice of um, tax audit, then the penalty is immediately 50% plus a 4% monthly penalty from the date of the error until uh, the tax assessment. Uh, so in theory, if uh, your FTA sits on this tax audit for four years until they actually um, do the tax assessment, then any voluntary disclosures or any uh, tax assessments which relates to those open uh, periods, they might be subject to high penalties, right? Uh, and as FTA decides to be lenient on that, you know, simply by giving you notice in before the end of the five-year period, uh, let's say in January, they're able to then, you know, wait for four years before they conduct a tax audit uh, and any errors found during that period might be subject to high penalties. Um, also, it means that from counting uh, record keeping perspective, you know, you should start uh, changing your uh, practices to make sure that you keep records for nine years, uh, not five years anymore. Uh, but also the fact that they are saying that um, if you do do voluntary disclosure in the fifth year from the relevant tax period, uh, they only have one year to do a, a tax audit. It does encourage people to actually go and review uh, their private returns, uh, not wait for, to receive a notice of tax audit, but to do a voluntary disclosure uh, and therefore try to um, encourage the FTA to complete you know, any asset assessments and tax assessments earlier rather than uh, be open to this uncertainty for the four years. Um, another interesting change, which was also in the same article, uh, 79, um, is that there are no voluntary disclosures uh, after five years um, from the end of relevant tax period. So uh, if you, you know, you have made an error in specific tax period, currently there is no officially any deadline for voluntary disclosures. Now you cannot do one for disclosures if five years have passed. Uh, while it's good, you know, if, uh, for businesses, if there was underpayment of tax, uh, it also impacts you if, for example, there was a, a, a over overpayment of tax. So, for example, you did not recover some input tax in respect of some invoices which were uh, issued to you in 2018. Uh, you know, you might, for some reason, you didn't put them through your returns. Uh, as we know, the, uh, in order to claim input tax in respect of uh, your expenses, you have to put it in the same period where you meet conditions such as uh, receiving tax invoice or in the subsequent tax period. So if you haven't put your uh, expenses, if you haven't claimed your input tax in those two periods, you have to do one for disclosure in order to be able to claim it afterwards. Uh, so <clears throat> this uh, new five-year limit on doing voluntary disclosures will potentially time bar businesses which is still have not claimed uh, for some reason input tax on those old invoices. So again, uh, businesses should review uh, whatever they have been doing, you know, uh, five years ago or before uh, the expiration five year period and see if there are any voluntary disclosures which they do want to make um, rather than wait for notice from the FTA for uh, tax audit or not being able to um, do voluntary disclosure, which they do want to put through themselves. Um, so um, there were other changes in the VAT law, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, 
we're not going to discuss them all. Um, you know, some of the other ones which was mentioning is that uh, the FTA now has a right to register taxpayers in specific cases. Um, then um, an amendment to Article 61, um, which is the uh, article which talks about adjustment events uh, when you need to issue a tax credit note or uh, another tax invoice. Um, so in subsection E, um, it used to say that one of the adjustment events when uh, tax was charged in error. Uh, now it has been changed. Uh, now says if uh, tax was charged in error or VAT treatment was incorrect, uh, which technically could mean all kinds of things. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, is it, does it mean that they, let's say if you have charged VAT at 0% when you should have charged VAT at, um, at 5%, are you simply able to issue a new tax invoice in respect of that error and claim it in the next, uh, and, and uh, account for it in the next tax return? Because that's what Article 62 says you're allowed to do. Uh, I have um, heard from the FTA that no, that's not the case. You know, if you did uh, underpay um, tax, so if you made error in respect to VAT rate, so you applied lower, lower rate than you should have, then you should actually be doing voluntary disclosure rather than uh, doing this uh, process of doing uh, issuing tax invoice and putting the next return. But you know, hopefully FTA will issue some kind of guidance on that or clarify that point. Um, uh, and uh, finally, uh, prior to the amendment, if you reported that you charge tax. Uh, in respect of supply, which wasn't actually subject to VAT, and you collected the money, you should have account for it to the FTA. Uh, after the amendment, even if you should tax invoice uh, or invoice uh, charging some tax when you shouldn't have, you should be accounting for the tax to the FTA, even if you did not receive that uh, amount. Um, as I said, there are other changes um, in the VAT law. We're not discussing them here. Um, but if you have a question, specific one, you can you can ask it. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, EVAT executive regulations amendments, which just came out today. Uh, in essence, there are two provisions which have been changed only. So uh, the first one will impact more people. Uh, in Article 3, subsection 2 of the executive regulations, uh, it now specifies that the supply of service does not include a provision of uh, director functions uh, by natural persons. So before this particular amendment, if uh, I'm an independent director, uh, I'm treated as making a taxable supplies of services to the company by which I'm employed. So if your uh, compensation is more than 375,000, you should be registering for VAT. Uh, this, you know, a lot of people would not do it, but that's, technically the rule. Um, well, this amendment does remove that requirement. So now it says supply of uh, services, you know, of performance of functions of a member of a board of directors is not a uh, taxable supply. So it's not supply of service. Uh, so those directors now do not need to register. Uh, if you have already registered, you can deregister from the VAT. This only applies to natural persons. If you're a legal person, you still need to charge VAT. If uh, a company or legal person is a director of a board, uh, on, on the board of directors of some other company. Um, the other changes are all in Article 72. Uh, one of them uh, relates to, um, to uh, accounting, uh, to, to report keeping uh, and MRP, MRP, uh, accounting uh, where you do not have a fixed, fixed establishment in the UAE. Uh, so just clarifies that if you have a place of establishment, that's where you should be uh, recording your transactions. But if you do not have a P in the UAE, so in effect, you do not have P or fixed establishment in the UAE at all, uh, then you need to uh, record a transaction in the Emirate in, where, in which a supply is received. Um, so it's just clarification of that particular provision, which previously did not uh, explain what happens when you might not have a fixed establishment, but uh, you might have a place of establishment. 
Um, and the other changes are in subsection four to six, um, and they relate to uh, uh, record keeping and the uh, Emirate, uh, Emirate account uh, reporting of uh, supplies for e-commerce sales. So it is really for suppliers, large e-commerce suppliers uh, whose uh, sales are more than 100 million dirhams per calendar year. Uh, then they will have to report their sales uh, in Emirates in which you know, those uh, goods and services are received. Uh, and there are some conditions, you know, some uh, rules about when each of those companies need to start implementing the, um, this new reporting rules and it will depend on their existing size. So whether or not they already exceeded uh, 100 million in 2022 or whether they'll exceed it later. So this is all we have for VAT law and VAT regulations. I will pass it on now to Git and he will discuss uh, the um, changes to the FTP law. Thank you, thank you Vlad uh, for that uh, insight. So, so we have 150 people uh, attending our webinar, which is quite overwhelming. So uh, I'll take up the second part of this presentation, which is on the key amendments related to the tax procedures law. Uh, so, and uh, important to note is that these amendments in the tax procedures law will come in effect from 1st of March, 2023. Uh, so before I start uh, discussing the amendments related to the tax procedure law, I'll just give a brief background about what this law is. So basically the objective of this law is to regulate the administration and collection of taxes in the UAE. Uh, it is divided into four parts, first being the role and the obligations of the taxpayer in terms of undertaking tax compliance, warranty disclosure, etc. Second part of the law is covers the role of the FTA, the procedure that needs to be followed for audit and then issuing uh, assessment and uh, decision. And the third and the most important part is, which covers, uh, which is covered in this law is the tax dispute resolution. So it basically mentions the entire uh, system of how the tax disputes have to be uh, uh, filed before the various uh, judicial forums. Uh, and, and then the last but not the least, uh, the list of all the tax violations and the maximum penalties that could be applied in case of a tax violation. So these are the four uh, 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 parts of this particular law. And most important part is that it, it is applies to all the federal taxes. So not just VAT or excise tax, this would also apply to corporate tax and any other federal tax which could be introduced in the future. So moving on to the first amendment that I'd like to discuss in this webinar is the term business. Uh, so currently the term business has been defined as any activity which is conducted regularly and on an independent basis by a person, which could be a commercial activity or a professional or a vocational activity. And it will also include any activity related to use of material or non-material property. Now, this appears to be a translation issue, but now they have tweaked this definition uh, post-amendment to include any activity which is for use of tangible or intangible properties or a residual entry of any other activity. Now, what does this mean uh, to businesses here? Let's say for an example, individual holds multiple uh, real estate properties and earns a rental income uh, out of those properties. Would this be classified as a business income subject to corporate tax. This is something that uh, uh, everybody should watch out for uh, once the corporate tax law comes in. But uh, before we understand that many family groups are planning to do a tax structuring whereby they would like to move their real estate assets from books of the company to the individual. Maybe with this definition uh, and change in the definition, uh, uh, one has to be careful and should wait for the corporate tax law to come to give more clarity on, on the taxability related to the individual's rental income. Uh, moving to the second uh, definition that I would like to discuss is the business days. Currently, there is no definition which has been specified in the procedures law. Uh, so as you would know, for each uh, appeal process, there are timelines specified. Uh, for an example, reconsideration application is has to be filed within 40 business days from the date of decision. The last year, the timeline was 20 working days, and there was always an ambiguity on whether a weekend or a public holiday has to be covered as part of the 40 day uh, calculation. Now, post amendment, they have inserted this definition to mean any day of the week 
excluding weekends and federal government holidays. Uh, so this will give a lot of clarity to taxpayers who are wishing to, who are planning to file a tax dispute uh, before a judicial forum. Uh, with the new penalty regime, the tax litigation cases have so far have gone drastically down, but anybody who would be planning to file a tax dispute resolution uh, will have to keep uh, these business days uh, definition in mind. Uh, third important amendment that uh, is there in the voluntary disclosure is related to the uh, uh, is related to the voluntary disclosure. Uh, so as you would know, in the tax procedures law, there are scenarios which have been provided uh, where a correction or of error or omission has to be uh, uh, opted by the taxpayer. So you know, there are three scenarios which have been specified in the tax procedures law. One is if there is a case of an underpayment of VAT, so a taxpayer has to mandatorily file a voluntary disclosure. Let's say if there is a refund which has been overclaimed, then again, uh, a, a taxpayer has to file a VD. But if you are overpaid the tax, then it you may file a VD. So you have an option to file a VD and claim back the excess amount that you were paid. So these were the three scenarios which were specified in the current uh, pro uh, procedures law. And there was a reference to the executive regulations which gave a monetary limit of 10,000 grams. So if the VAT impact is more than 10,000, then you have to file a voluntary disclosure. And if the if the net impact is less than 10,000, then you could correct it through a uh, current VAT return. Now, post amendment. So what has happened? So in the post amendment, they have added a fourth category, which is any error or omission, even if it does not result in any tax due. So for an example, uh, a, a company has uh, missed to report a zero rated supply or an exempt supply. Now, which will not have any impact on the tax due. But un under this fourth category, you would necessarily re be required to file a voluntary disclosure. Now, this needs to be seen whether uh, the penalty for, for every error, does the company need to file a mandatory VD? And we expect that the executive regulations would be amended and will give a more clarity on this particular aspect. Now, moving on to the uh, administrative penalties, uh, currently, uh, for every tax violation, there is a penalty uh, which is prescribed under the cabinet decision. And under the procedures law, there is a band which is given that the minimum penalty is 500 dirhams and the maximum it could go to is three times the tax amount. Now, post amendment, they have reduced the pen uh, minimum penalty to nil and the maximum penalty to two times of the tax amount. Now, if you read voluntary disclosure and this penalty provision, uh, it suggests that if you have missed to report any exempt supply or a zero rated supply or a RCM transaction, there could be no penalty under the post amendment uh, uh, period. So, but for this, we need to wait for a cabinet decision to be amended on administrative penalties, uh, which will give a more clarity on how this will be taken care of. Now, moving to the tax dispute resolution system. So currently, this is the uh, hierarchy of a judicial system where uh, you could uh, file a tax dispute appeal or, a, or a ab objection. So once you file a voluntary disclosure or a tax audit, uh, you can go for a review before the FTA through a reconsideration uh, channel. And uh, if you are seeking a penalty waiver, then there is a separate uh, channel for penalty waiver application. For both these uh, uh, reconsideration and penalty waiver, there are separate committees. and if you are uh, not happy with the reconstruction decision, then you could go to TDRC and then to federal courts. Now, in the post amendment scenario, they have added a new layer, which is the tax assessment review request. So this is a quite a welcome move uh, here in the sense that uh, earlier, there was only a one layer of uh, review with the FTA. Now, the businesses will have two layers of review, which could be possibly mitigated through uh, with the FTA by making a submission. And, and then if you are not uh, agree with the decision, then you could go to the TDRC and the federal courts. Uh, in terms of the forms and, and the committee, the form would be prescribed by the FTA for this tax assessment review request and the timelines remains the same, which is 40 business days. And it needs to be seen whether FTA is going to have a separate committee for this uh, review request or we will have a existing uh, FTA policy team who will be looking at uh, this kind of review request. Now, in terms of other key changes, so before I move on, uh, I'll just uh, let's have a, another poll question. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Vilas, can we have another poll question, please? So the poll question is, are you in a position to submit FTA audit files and revenue reconciliation within 10 business days? Uh, if every, if every, all of you can share your uh, views on this. Okay, so we have uh, uh, the answers and 60% of the, uh, the participants uh, says that they are not ready uh, to submit FT audit files and remaining reconciliation within 10 business days. So, which means that with FT audit notice uh, expected in 2023, uh, some of you should become ready with your audit files and reconciliations. Now, in relation to this, I'll just uh, discuss the key change. Uh, so. For a notification of audit, so FTA currently can give an audit notice uh, at least uh, five days, uh, business days prior and, and commence the audit. Now, post amendment, this has been revised to 10 minimum days. So uh, before 10 days, it could give an audit notice and seek uh, information for uh, commencing the audit. The second uh, uh, key change that we have uh, come across is related to the tax offenses and penalties. So in, in specific tax evasion cases, the penalties have been reduced from five times the tax evade, uh, evasion amount uh, to three times. And there is a new clause which has been added in relation to submission of false information or concealment. So even if you submit false information, there could be an imprisonment and a penalty not exceeding 81 million. So these are the key changes related to tax procedures law that uh, we wanted to cover and, and update you. Uh, in terms of way forward, uh, so based on what we just discussed, uh, we believe that there are three areas where uh, businesses should be ready with. First is a VAT compliance. So since there are timelines specified for tax invoices and tax credit notes, which is 14 uh, days from the event, uh, companies should improve their AR process, uh, whereby uh, the, these uh, timelines are followed for tax invoices as well as for tax credit notes, and the invoice is raised or a tax credit note is raised within 14 days. Import documentation, I, again, this is a very important uh, uh, topic where uh, companies should ask for import documents before recovering input tax. So when you file a VAT return, you should have all your import documents in place before recovering any input tax on your imports in box number 10. Uh, taking to the second uh, box, uh, Vlad, if you want to cover this, yeah. Yeah, so um, obviously with the, you know, the new five-year period for, voluntary disclosures, uh, you do want to make sure that you review your prior returns, uh, prior periods, and consider you know, whether or not you need to do voluntary disclosure. Um, and you know, it also relates to the mandatory submission of voluntary disclosures for um, uh, even new uh, changes of tax payable, which uh, Git was talking about. So you also have to make sure that you record those, you know, you cannot just simply ignore them or put them through in the next return. You need to do voluntary disclosure in respect of those. And for FTA audits, uh, you know, 80% of you have been lucky so far. You know, we didn't have any VAT audit, uh, but this might change. So the amendments introduced by uh, the FTA, uh, which gives themselves more time to uh, conduct tax audits, you know, as long as they issue a notice, uh, does indicate that they're very serious about VAT. You know, the fact that the corporate tax is being introduced, you know, potentially effective in a couple of years, um, doesn't mean that they will not start, or, you know, continue taking VAT seriously. Uh, and obviously with the increases in their resources, you know, the hiring uh, also for corporate tax purposes, uh, you know, they are in position to conduct more and more tax audits. Uh, so review your tax, previous tax periods. If there are any errors, uh, consider voluntary disclosure, uh, you know, before you receive any notice of tax audit, because uh, once you do receive that notice of tax audit, you're potentially subject to a few years of uncertainty. 
uh, plus high penalties. Uh, so you do not want to get to that point. Yeah. And I mean, the second poll question that we had, almost 60% of the companies are not ready with their submissions. So this is something that uh, companies should work upon and, and try to ensure that all the audit files and reconciliations are in place. So as and when there is an audit notice uh, comes, uh, we should be in a position to submit those details because proactiveness in, in audit will uh, definitely help you uh, in, in getting a good uh, favorable results with the FTA. Yeah. In so moving on to the Q&A. So we have about five minutes. Uh, maybe we can take a few questions uh, that has been posted by some of the people. Okay, so the first question is uh, on the import of goods, uh, whether custom document, what would include in custom import documents? Would, will BOE would be sufficient? So whether bill of entry would be sufficient for uh, for recovering input tax? Vlad, your, your take on this? No, to say he's still uncertain about that. Uh, I do think they mean uh, official documents from the, um, from the customs authorities. So uh, whatever documents, customs issues to uh, indicate that the input has been done, uh, you know, this is what will be required. Um, there was another question before that, uh, at least on my screen. Um, if we pay advance to supply for out of scope transactions, um, is the reverse charge mechanism applicable on such advances? Um, Okay, you're talking about out of scope transactions. Uh, so presumably it means either out of scope because it's not a supply or because the place of supply is outside the UAE. Uh, RCM is not applicable to out scope transactions, right? So the reverse charge mechanism is only applicable when you first determine that the place of supply is in, in the UAE and it is a proper supply. Uh, so, um, you know, the typical uh, B2B sub. Uh, place supply for services would be that a non-resident supplier um, uh, supplies some services to a UAE business, you know, in which case the place of supply moves into the UAE, uh, in which case you don't need to consider whether RCM applies. Uh, but if you determine that place of supply is outside the UAE, then RCM should not apply. Uh, Next question, you want to take? A... Yeah, so one of the questions that has been raised by uh, the participants is on the, if a tax invoice is raised on behalf of the buyer, does the 14 days timeline apply? Uh, yes, so the answer is yes. Uh, if you are, uh, if you as a buyer, you are uh, raising an invoice on behalf of the seller, then the 14 days will still apply because uh, the, are, the provisions related to the supplier will uh, also apply to the buyer who is raising on, on the behalf of supplier. The, the provision actually refers to the registrant who in theory can be a supplier or recipient. It doesn't okay. specifically talk about supplier. Um, so another question is, can you issue a consolidated tax credit note for multiple invoices after the amendment? Uh, so the position does not change. Uh, if you have a credit note for multiple invoices, then you can issue a tax credit note for multiple tax invoices provided you have the reference put in for each of the tax invoice. So either you have it in the, on the face of the credit note, you have all the details of your tax invoices uh, against which you are issuing a credit note, or maybe you can have an annexure which specifies the list of tax invoices uh, related to which you are issuing a tax credit note. So yes, uh, the provision, uh, the impact does not change before or after the amendment. Yep. Uh, uh, so can you, do a um, VT refund application after five years? Uh, yes, the, the, the rules are not in respect of refund applications in respect of voluntary disclosures. So let's say if you already had a refund sitting in your account as in, uh, you're eligible to refund for something what was more than five years ago, uh, there is nothing currently in the legislation which prevents you from uh, applying for that refund. But the interesting part is in the excise tax law, there is a specific provision which says that you cannot file a refund after five years. But surprisingly, that's not covered in the VAT law. So okay. this is something that needs to be tested, frankly mm. speaking, because the term which is used in the law is tax assessment. And a tax assessment definition is uh, any decision issued by the authority for payable tax or a refundable tax. Now, if that is the, the the definition of tax assessment, then 
would it apply to a VAT refund scenario? Will FTA be able to issue a tax assessment for approving a refund, which is more than five years? So this is something which is a bit tricky and, and our advice to the client would be to file a clarification on this and or file a VAT refund now and, and rather than waiting for five years to be over. So company yeah. which is looking for a refund for 2018 should file it immediately uh, today. There is a question about uh, changes, you know, what are the changes for transport related services? We didn't cover it today, but um, basically the place of supply for transport related services was now uh, included in the VAT law, which says the place of supply is where the transport commences. Uh, in practice, it hasn't actually changed anything uh, because previously and, and still, uh, there is also a place of supply role for transport related services and executive regulations, which says that the place of supply of transport related services is the same as the related transportation service. Uh, and if you connect this, you know, considering that place supply for transportation service is where it commences, then it's, it's one and the same. It, in practice, there is no change. And interestingly enough, you know, even though the FTA had just released the executive regulations, they amended once. You know, after I saw that they now included the place of supply for transport related services into the VAT law, I thought they're going to remove the, you know, the equivalent provision in the VAT executive regulations, but they haven't. It's still there. So, um, but yeah, that's a summary of the changes. Um, I think, yeah. So for other questions, maybe Vlad, we can uh, respond to them uh, uh, on a separately on an email. Uh, but now with the short of time, I think we just finished at five. So maybe. We can take and take that them up uh, separately. Yeah, well, let's do that. Um, again, thank you for, to everybody for participating. Uh, please keep uh, you know be free to get in touch. Um, you know, if you want to discuss any changes or anything else, uh, you know, happy to talk to you. You know, happy to help. Um, hopefully, you enjoy this and hope it's been useful. Great. Thank you, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, for the participation. Uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.